Welcome to the Concussion Talk podcast with Phoenix Concussion Recovery. My name is Lauren Zayax, and I work at Wasatch Physical Therapy and Sports Medicine in Park City, Utah. And I'm also a co-founder of phoenixconcussionrecovery.com. And we have our return to sport, return to life in sport exercise program, as well as all of our free educational content on our website. Uh, this week, I was over at the American Physical Therapy Association's Combined Sections Meeting, or CSM. And my colleagues and I were able to present two posters on our research in concussions. So we're going to talk mostly about those today. And then if there's some time at the end, I'll talk about a few of the pearls that were presented over at CSM this week. Um, so the first poster that we did, it was with my former OSU student, Rose Gardenia. And we detailed our preliminary timeline. Uh, we want to help show how we should be integrating these vision and vestibular therapies and really be treating them as two separate specialties that work together. And this is primarily for people with protracted recovery. So a concussion that lasts more than 30 days or a person who had a concussion and still has symptoms more than 30 days out, since we don't really know if that person is still actively concussed or not at that point. What we do know is that about 15 to 20% of people actually experience a protracted recovery so most people are going to get better within a month without doing very much at all. But there's a significant chunk of people who are going to have long-term symptoms. We're following this new method where they actually have these post-concussion disorders. And so the patient that we did our case on would fit into this vestibular ocular post-concussion disorder bucket. And so they're still working on the research on that, but that's where she would, that's, that's the place that she would fit into. Um, this type of disorder is characterized by dizziness and vertigo, posture, gait instability, motion sensitivity, eye strain or ache, diplopia, which is double vision, headache, and difficulty concentrating. Uh, this, what's really interesting about vestibular ocular PCD is that it's often misdiagnosed, but it's actually pretty easy to identify if you just do the right types of screens early on. So we're recommending a vision and vestibular screen. Now you really should be qualified, you should be certified in these types of advanced therapies, but not everybody is, not everybody has the time or desire to do so. So we're also recommending that you could just complete the VOM screen, which would be considered standard of practice. Um, and that screen looks at vision movements um, and vestibular, provoking vestibular symptoms with easy tests where you're actually just tracking their symptoms. You're not necessarily looking for nystagmus, you're just looking for an increase in symptoms. And then you can refer those patients on to a specialist if needed. So our patient was a 16-year-old female. She was referred to our clinic uh, 25 days after her injury. She'd already had some cervical spine or neck PT, and there was limited improvement, so she was sent over to our clinic. We had nine total vision and vestibular therapy visits with her. We did outcome measures that had been uh, proven by research, so the activities balance questionnaire, the convergence insufficiency symptom survey, the dizziness handicap index, and the post-concussion symptom survey. And we completed uh, comprehensive vision, vestibular, and balance assessments at initial eval and final eval we also did a five-month um, outcome measure where we had her come back and, and we did a follow-up visit with her. So um, at 107 days after her injury, so after we did all of our therapy, we completed a discharge eval and we found that we had near resolution of all impairments and that she had returned to all of her functional activities. She did continue to have some mild deficits, um, such as some mild headaches with school. She was still having some difficulty with driving, that sort of thing but she was primarily back to all of her favorite activities. She was back in her school plays, all those sorts of things. Um, it should be noted that she had some significant psychological implications, including uh, 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 OCD, sorry about that. And so this uh, can actually lead to a longer recovery, but she still did great. She still achieved an excellent outcome and she still met within our norms and our typical visit numbers. So for her outcome measures, her ABC, improved from 66%, so her fear of falling basically improved from a 66% to a 96% confidence that she could do her daily activities. Her convergence insufficiency score improved from a 31, which is really high, over 16 is positive on that test for youth, and it decreased down to a 19. So she did still have subjective symptoms even though she had improved objectively at baseline or at the final eval. Her dizziness handicap index was pretty severe at the initial eval at 78, and it decreased all the way down to a 14 at the final visit. And her post-concussion symptom score was 46, and that decreased down to 10. So we should note that she still had symptoms, but she went back to her favorite activity. So she was back to activity, even though she still had a 10 on that PCSS score. 
And so that was something that was harped on a lot at CSM is that what is symptom free? Um, how do we actually, what weight do we put on all these symptoms? And, and we can talk about that at the end if we have time. So she came back for a five month follow up after her discharge and reported that she was back to all of her activities. She wasn't limited in any way. She was no longer using her IEP at school, which is those official accommodations that some of these kids have. And she was feeling normal, which was really exciting, whatever normal means, right? Um, she had sustained two subsequent head injuries, including uh, being on a roller coaster and, and feeling like she had a whiplash injury. She didn't have any treatment for those. Overall, she didn't notice any significant change in her status. And this was really exciting to us because the uh, changes that we had made with vision therapy held even though she had another injury afterwards. This case was complicated because of the multiple injuries prior to our evaluation. So she had gotten hurt water tubing, but then was had several more more injuries before she was finally seen in therapy. She had that history of OCD, but it still supports our timeline that we presented at CSM for this integration of vision and vestibular therapy in the right order and helping these people, these really complicated concussion cases who are having uh, significant deficits in their activities of daily living, their ability to participate in school and sport, and these guys can get better. We want to do a statement. We want to do a retrospective data analysis looking at the outcomes using this protocol, but we're going to have to do so prior to our work starting with the primitive reflexes, which is the second poster that I'm going to talk about. So in our timeline for our treatment in the first three weeks, uh, we believe that treatment should focus on vertigo, which can be treated right away, C-spine treatment, so neck pain, whiplash injuries, that sort of thing, and doing a physical exercise progression. So 80% of people are going to have a visual deficit in the first week, but only about 50% of these people are going to have long-term symptoms. So in that first three weeks, we should really be focusing on the things that we can treat with manual therapy, with canalith repositioning maneuvers for the vertigo, and starting them back into exercise because a lot of these people are going to get better without having to do any of the fancy therapy. So you don't need any of these more advanced skills. And then you can refer on to somebody else if you need to, if they, if they aren't getting better by that three-week mark. Sometimes, um, there's a little addendum to our protocol, if a patient is doing really well and they're trying to get back to sport and they have some mild visual deficits, we will start eye exercises in the second week, but that is not the norm for our clinic. The majority of our patients do not start vision therapy until the third week. Uh, in the first two to three weeks of the advanced therapy, so we've hit that three-week mark, we're now going to do our vision and our vestibular screen. We focus primarily on ocular motor exercises, so pursuits and saccades. And then we'll add balance with and without vision and divided attention tasks like Kirshner arrows, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't add habituation therapy. So I uh, head and ear and eye exercises, shaking your head while looking at your thumb, that sort of thing. We don't add those until about the third to fourth week of therapy. So it's, it's really different from a lot of other people. And it's in conflict with some of the recommendations. But we really don't know in the concussion world what is the right order. We start habituation therapy later based on the patients that we've had come to our clinic because they weren't getting better elsewhere. And in a lot of those places, they were doing VORs first and patients weren't getting better. And so they came to us. We found that we don't have that decline in function before we have the incline in function if we do vision first. So that's why we do it that way. Um, we add vergences, which is your eyes working together and teaming together in that third to fourth week as well. So adding habituation therapy and adding invergences to the more complicated eye stuff happens around that third to fourth week. So that's a big time in our, in our rehab program, in um, our clinic. Our vergences are treated under the direction of an eye doctor. That's the way that it should be done. You can actually cause more harm than good when you're treating convergence and divergence and accommodative insufficiencies. So it's really important that when we have continuing ed courses, we're talking about the fact that there needs to be a neurooptometrist or an ophthalmologist, depending on what you believe, on board. But an eye doctor needs to be on board. In the fourth to sixth week of therapy, we progress to habituation, vision, and motion. So that could be walking on the treadmill and doing eye exercises or Marsden ball at the same time. And then we add in visual vestibular exercises. So now we're doing vision and adding in that vestibular load at the same time. So maybe they're jumping on a trampoline and doing a four square scanning exercise, or they're doing a Kirshner arrow, and they're also moving up and down on a BOSU ball, that sort of thing. Uh, we found that with this protocol, our average visits are only eight to 12 visits over the course of three to four months. This is coinciding with traditional vision therapy findings. So traditional vision therapy is about six to 12 months, but that's for developmental delays. And our average patient is with us 
uh, for about three to six months. They typically are doing a one to two month independent home program. So after three to four months of therapy or eight to 12 visits, we hit a point where they're good at their home program and all they need to do is just go home and do their homework every day. And they do that for about four to eight weeks and people are getting better. So it's been really exciting. The take home message is vision shouldn't start until after three weeks, um, except in extenuating circumstances. Habituation therapy or uh, VOR exercises shouldn't be added until about three weeks after you've been working on vision. And then the vergence exercises, like working on your eyes working together, shouldn't add in until about three weeks after you've been doing pursuits and saccades. So we really want to change up and create a structured platform for people who want to do these advanced therapies. And we can make, um, we're hoping to have this case study published and then our diagram will actually be available to anybody to look at and you'll be able to see the whole case study. Um, We're hoping that that will be accepted in the next couple months here. So that brings us to our second uh, primitive reflex poster. This is the one that we're really excited about because it's a brand new idea in the world of concussion as opposed to vision and vestibular therapy is something people have been talking about for a while. Uh, My colleague Chelsea Brown and I have been building this new treatment paradigm and we've been tailoring it since about May. So we've got it dialed in now at this point. About 200 people have gone through this new protocol. We feel really good about it and we're starting to be able to do some research and and we want to get the word out there. So CSM was the place where we finally unveiled this info and we were able to release it out into the public, which was, yay, a huge ordeal for us. Uh, Our primitive reflex poster builds from our vision and vestibular. So we are altering that protocol, um, but basically we want to add in primitive reflexes in that first three weeks. So ideally, we're addressing primitive reflexes early on. And then we're only doing vision and vestibular therapy to address what's left over. So what we've been finding is that if we address these primitive reflexes, we actually have less vision deficits that we need to work on. And we, and we think that's related to this brainstem, orient, uh, brainstem originated vision disorders instead of that true occipital lobe vision disorder. And this isn't really the appropriate place to talk about that, but that's where that, that theory sort of comes from. So once primitive reflexes are addressed, we then flow people into that vision vestibular uh, rehab protocol that we developed. So it's become a little bit more fluid uh, because of these new reflexes changing everything for us. So the case study, the poster that we did was on a 13 year old female. Uh, She had a concussion without a loss of consciousness while she was ice skating. So it is a sports related concussion, even though it's an atypical sport. She was referred to our specialty clinic 31 days post injury. She had had two weeks of uh, C-spine or neck treatment without any improvement. That's why she was referred to us. We did a comprehensive vision and vestibular eval. Um, That's our typical protocol like we always do on that first visit. We treated her for vertigo in the first visit. Uh, We also provided education for activity modifications, school accommodations. We added blue blockers, that sort of thing to improve tolerance at school. And then we provided an initial home program for ocular motor control. Now, what was exciting was we had been looking into primitive reflexes at this point, um, but we were still sticking to our old protocol. So she started with eye exercises in that first week. She comes in. Uh, the vertigo was a lot better. It wasn't perfect. So we did one additional cantilith repositioning maneuver to resolve the vertigo. So that was perfect. That was right within protocol of one to three visits or one to three treatments. And uh, she was having significant difficulty with the home program. So she was complaining that doing those easy pursuit and saccade exercises were actually increasing her headaches throughout the week. So she was having a really hard time doing the program. So we were like, all right, well, let's try our new screen with her that we've been developing for the last two months and see what happens. Um, So we we completed our new primitive reflex screen on that second visit. We looked at the Moro reflex, the ATNR, asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. Symmetrical tonic neck reflex, STNR, tonic labyrinthine reflex, TLR, and the Gallant reflex. I want to um, note here that we built this new protocol um, using existing research. So it's not like we just went rogue and created our own thing. We took from early intervention, um, so in pediatrics and in vision therapy with eye doctors and OTs, they've been using primitive reflexes forever. Some people feel primitive reflexes have fallen out of favor. Some PTs still live and die by primitive reflexes. Uh, but that's for those guys to fight it out in the early intervention pediatric world. That's not, it's not for us to, to decide, right? So we took from them and we just applied it to our patients. So there's research supporting all of the interventions that we did, just not in this new population. 
Um, and so we applied these existing reflexes. Uh, the reason that we did so was because of their current use in ADD and vision therapy, but also because when you look at primitive reflex retention, the kiddos have complaints of difficulty with concentration, balance, reading and writing, they're easily fatigued, they have memory deficits, they have motion intolerance, and they have mood disturbances, which sounds exactly like a concussed person, right? So we said, well, these people sound the same, similar treatments are being done for them, so let's try it out and see what happens, right? So the patient was screened, she was positive for all five reflexes, so we want to try to publish the screening tool, that's one of the things that we're working on right now. We took all the existing screening tools and we compiled them into one easy to use document for people. And so she was positive on all five reflexes using that new screening tool. And we put all of her vision and vestibular therapy on hold and initiated a primitive reflex program instead. So for three weeks, instead of doing our normal eye exercises for three weeks, we focused primarily on primitive reflex integration. So that was a big shift for us. But she started getting better, so we just stayed on that program. I mean, at the end of the day, all that matters is the patient gets better, right? So at day 38, we started primitive reflexes one week after her initial eval. At day 49, she demonstrated full reintegration, and we completed a reassessment at that point and did a, a new eye screen. We redid her vestibular screen, and then we decided where should we go from here. She had reported improved tolerance to school and dance class. So by just working on her reflexes, she was noting improvement in her a tolerance to her functional activities. So she did have mild deficits remaining at that day 49, significant improvement on evaluation, but mild deficits remain, so we decided to keep going with the therapy. Uh, we continued until day 63. At that point, she was discharged with an independent home program, which is typical for us. So often patients are discharged once they're feeling a lot better, but they continue to address those mild deficits at home. Her PCSS score had decreased, or her post-concussion symptom score had decreased from 49 down to 4, which was really exciting. Her dizziness handicap index went from 48 to 16, so she did still have dizziness. Uh, her activities balance confidence questionnaire, so how confident are you that you won't fall doing different activities, went from a 73 to a 96. And her convergence insufficiency survey, uh, symptom survey went from a 53, which is a ginormous number for a kiddo. Um, over 16 is positive, again, like for the other one, for a kid. And she went from 53 all the way down to 2 with minimal vision therapy. So that was really exciting for us to see. So there are confounding variables in this case study, particularly because we had to add in the eye exercises earlier than we are now. But that was because we didn't really know if we were doing the right thing at that point. So we, we didn't want to not be treating the eye exercises just to see what would happen with primitive reflexes. That would not be ethical so we did add in some low-level eye exercises early on around the second or third follow-up visit. We were doing some divided attention, complex motor tasks like Kirshner arrows. We were doing balance exercises. But there was a lot less emphasis placed on these. So the majority of our exercises of our 60-minute session was spent on primitive reflexes. And then about 20 minutes was spent on these other types of exercises. Typically, the full 60 minutes would be spent in those other areas. So it was a lot less time in our in-office visits. Her home exercise program did not consist of any ocular motor or vestibular exercises until after three weeks of primitive reflexes. So again, a huge deviation from our original protocols that we were using. Vestibular rehab started at the fourth week of therapy or her third follow-up visit. And that's when we started adding in some of those easy head movement exercises, but she still needed to work on those a lot after that um, final eval. So we required an overall decrease in physical therapy compared to our typical patient. So we had seven total visits, including our initial and final eval, as opposed to our typical of eight to 12. She returned to all of her activities faster than the typical patient. It only took 25 days of therapy for her to be back into dance and not having any issues. Um, and so it was really exciting for us. So what that case study did was it sparked us to say, wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? We need to look into this further, right? So at, after dealing with that kiddo's case, we actually implemented a protocol to screen all patients in the first or second visit for primitive reflex disinhibition. So this was a huge shift for us. And that is what led to our 200 patients being screened um, since her case. So it was really big for our clinic. And now we're hoping that it can be big for other people's clinics as well. Uh, now when we start therapy, if they have primitive reflexes present, which almost every single one of them does, I think we've had five or six negatives. Um, we'll know more once we are able to go back and synthesize the data. 
Um, we now provide an initial home program focusing on primitive reflexes, and we don't add in eye exercises for the home program until we're able to phase out through two phases of primitive reflex. So we have two levels of primitive reflex integration exercises, and then we add in vision after that. And we're noticing that people are turning the corner, if you will. They're getting better, faster. We're noticing that people need less sessions. And we're actually seeing improvement in eye movements and those deficits of eye movements after just doing primitive reflex exercises, which is really exciting, but we have to prove it with research, right? So that's the next step. Um, again, like I said, we normally do 60 minutes of just vision and vestibular, but now we're adding in this other component of the primitive reflexes. We're addressing the low level exercises. So we're doing visual discrimination, maybe um, finding the difference between two pictures, that sort of thing. Uh, we do figure ground, which is basically scanning a picture and looking for objects in the picture. But now we're doing them in these writing reflex postures. So instead of doing them the way we used to, where you're standing or sitting, we're actually incorporating them into the reflex integration process for motor control. And we're having people sit in different postures. They have to balance in certain ways with one knee up and high kneeling, that sort of thing. And uh, we're able to follow these motor control theories. So in motor control theory, primitive reflexes are replaced by these writing and postural reflexes. So we're trying now to follow the way that your brain should be developing as we do our concussion rehab. So we're going from primitive reflexes into writing reflexes, incorporating vision and vestibular therapy with those. Um, we're really excited about primitive reflexes because they're a skill set that's really easy to be taught. It's not that difficult. The motor control theory is a little bit tedious and, and can get a little bit muddy, but actually doing the skill set is not that hard. Uh, we feel that athletic trainers, PTs, OTs, speech language pathologists, all of these people could be really important in this treatment paradigm. You don't need that significant of resources. You need a table and some bouncy balls. You don't need a lot to be able to do this type of therapy. There's no known harm to patients. Um, you just need to be able to orthopedically do them. If you can't do a bird dog exercise, we can replace that with something else. So it's not that big of a deal. The exercises are mimicking core exercises. So it's safe for concussion patients to be do patients with concussions to be doing early on in their rehab. We're focusing a lot on cross-body movements. Um, we've actually been able to start these exercises as early as 72 hours post-concussion with really good results. So we've been really excited about it. Um, we're in the process of creating an online CEU course to begin educating practitioners on these primitive reflexes. So look for that in the future if you have an interest in it. We really think that there's a value here in this concussion population. We're excited about the ease of implementation. We're excited about how early on in therapy you can do these exercises. And we're also excited about the low risk, which is really important in this concussion population because it means more providers can be involved without having to do these more advanced therapies. And then you can refer on to specialists who can address whatever is left over. Um, we've, I've gone on for a while here. So um, Nick, what are your opinions about, do we talk about anything from CSM or do we wrap it up here? Maybe we do a part two. I think part two is probably best. It's okay. 23 years now. Yeah, so let's do a let's do a part two, and we'll talk about some of the take home messages from CSM here in the next two weeks. So, guys, look for part two. Um, I hope that that wasn't too tedious for you to listen to our poster presentations, but we're really excited about them, and and we're really hoping to get them both published so that we can help have a mark on concussion rehab and stop having people searching for answers and get rid of these long term deficits that people simply don't need to have. I mean, there's treatment options out there. We just need to be well-educated, and we need to make sure people are getting the right types of treatments. There's no reason for kids to need continuing accommodations and have continuing issues in school when there are therapies out there where we can, we can fix these things with some hard work. So that's our big take-home message from our two poster presentations. Thanks for listening. Okay, Lauren, thanks. And where can people reach you or really so you guys can, your... Yeah, you can check us out at phoenixconcussionrecovery.com. If you're interested in a return to sport progression that's standardized, we want you to be under the direction of your local healthcare provider, but we actually have an online return to sport program on there. And then you can check out any of our free education. We have early um, education videos that you can use with your patients. So we want to be here to help support you. And then if you email the um, phoenixconcussion at gmail.com email, then I'll be able to respond to you and answer any questions that you might have. If you sign up for a newsletter, which is right there on the website, we'll be able to send out a blast when we finally get these things published and we'll be able to keep you up to date on all of our research. 
Great. Then Facebook and Twitter. And Facebook and Twitter. So at LZ Concussion because I still have not changed it. <laughs> so it's still it's still at LZ Concussion for our Phoenix Concussion uh, page, and we're also on Facebook at Phoenix Concussion Recovery. Um, and then if you're in the Utah area, we would love to see you. If you're having any extra issues over at Wasatch Physical Therapy, you can see myself or um, actually my colleague Chelsea, who I did the uh, poster with this week. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. As always, thank you for a great podcast, Lauren. The music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound, www.bensound.com.